started in Genesis. Uh, and God said to, in the Amplified, he said in verse 28 of Genesis 1, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, using all its vast resources in the service of God and man. And we went into what it takes to go into the promised land and take courage and, you know, and all that. Uh, this week, the Lord, through Joyce Meyer, revealed a scripture to me that I've never heard before. And in fact, I will give you a fair warning. Put your seatbelts on because you're going to hear stuff today that you've probably never heard before. So turn your spiritual ears on. Amen? Amen. I want yeah, I want to thank Mike and Trey for all the technical assistance this morning. <laughs> uh, I can see we're going to need to, to increase numbers just to be able to handle all this techie stuff I want to do. But it's part of the vision. It's part of the future. I mean, in the future, we're going to have the lights and everything going and, and a live band doing all that. And, and <laughs> I know this doesn't sound spiritual, but what the Lord's laid on my heart is to be the best show in town. So that people will come just for the show and get clobbered by the Holy Ghost while they're sitting there. <laughs> Who's that mouse? around here. Who is that mouse? <laughs> Jesus is going to be more famous than the mouse. Amen. Amen. But anyway, uh, turn to Exodus. This is the continuation this week, and this is a scripture that I've never heard before. This may not be something you've never heard, but I've never seen this scripture before in Ephesians or Exodus chapter 13 verse 17. And I'm reading this from the Living Bible. Verse 17 says, so at last Pharaoh let the people go. How many of you know the story of, you know, Moses went through, what, 40 years in the wilderness, finally understood the call of God on his life, went back, set the people free, had to have all the, the uh, plagues, the, the ten plagues, and finally the heart of Pharaoh was changed, and, and he's letting the people go here. So at last Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them through the land of the Philistines, although that was the most direct route from Egypt to the promised land. Isn't that strange? That God didn't lead them on the shortest path. Wouldn't you think God wanted them there the quickest as possible? But here's why. The rest of the verse, the reason was that God felt the people might become discouraged by having to fight their way through, even though they had left Egypt armed, he thought they might return to Egypt. Boy, does that speak to the character of man or what? Sure, we want the promised land as long as it's just handed to us. Sure, we want freedom as long as it's free. <laughs> you know, everybody in America still wants the freedom, but how many are signing up to go stand on the front lines and protect that freedom and realize there's a cost for freedom? Thank God we have a family here representing two of our brave, uh, actually three, two families here. Any of your family in the military? I've got a, a nephew on a Navy ship, and uh, Amy and Mike have two sons in the Army paying the price for freedom. You say, well, there's no big price to be paid these days. Well, have you have you seen what the military gets paid? <laughs> Just choosing that, you're also choosing lesser income. So they are paying a price, even if they're not being shot at. They're still paying a price to serve our country and freedom. But here, here's what happened. God knew that if he took Israel straight to the promised land, as soon as they saw they were going to have to fight to obtain what's theirs, that they would change their mind and head back to bondage. How many people do you know got free in God and thought, now it's going to be a bed of roses, and the first little obstacle that came up to walk in the freedom God gave them, or walk in the blessing God gave them, they said, oh, this God stuff doesn't work. It's because they didn't have the right idea. They didn't realize 
you know what we are in a we are in a war i've got good news and bad news the bad news is we're in a war the good news is be of good courage jesus has overcome Amen. you can walk in the victory that he's come but that doesn't mean just because you have the authority and the victory that doesn't mean you're not going to face obstacles and you're not going to have some forces that want to stop you from walking into what's yours god knew the people weren't ready so he he actually had to let that whole generation die out because unfortunately there was so much of so much of bondage that had become just a part of who they were that that generation never was ready to go into what god had for them and god had to take the next generation in and he used joshua to do that now there were a couple of people Joshua and Caleb were both in that original group and they both went into the promised land. So you have a choice. You can either be a Joshua or Caleb or you can die in the wilderness never having obtained. You know the sad thing is our graveyards are full of people who have never obtained what God had for them in their lifetime. Yeah, they, they might have gone to heaven when they died, but God had more than heaven for his people. God, had, uh, God has more than heaven when you die for you if, as his child. Yes. He has a place prepared for you. The other may be some struggles to get it. But once you're there and you've received it, the struggles will be... Uh, I heard uh, someone talk, telling the story of he had interviewed Evander Holyfield. How many know who Evander Holyfield is? He's actually, I didn't know this about him, he has won more heavyweight championships than any other boxer ever. Ever. And he, this guy was interviewing, what's the secret? And he said, I have a higher standard than most people. He said, I come early to training. I leave late. I've even invented new exercises to to help me, and he said, now, <laughs> the guy says, well, be honest, doesn't it hurt? He said, well, yeah, it hurts. You can't get in a fight and not hurt. He said, but here's what happens. When you're standing there at the end of the match and your hand is raised and they put the belt around you, he says, you don't even feel those blows that you just experienced. He said, but the guy that lost, <laughs> he feels every little pain and it's because I realized there was a price to get here, paid the price, and enjoyed the benefit. So here's the, here's the bad news. You're in a fight whether you want to be or not. You are in a fight. You didn't start the fight, but you're in a fight. The devil started the fight when he was thrown out of heaven because he once said, I will, I will be just like God. I will ascend to the throne of the Almighty. So he was thrown out of heaven cast out of heaven down to the earth and he's started a universal fight between good and evil and there, unfortunately there are no neutral you can't just say well I'm not going to be good and I'm not going to be evil there's no neutral sight you are in a fight the devil's doing everything he can to stop you from having what God has for you and you are going to have to fight to get into your promised land so say I'm ready, I'm ready. to fight for what's mine, what's mine? devil. devil. <laughs> uh, excuse me, just one second. <clears throat> Moving right along. Lord, give me the exact way to present this. This is the part you probably have never heard before. Anyway, let me just regress for just a minute. Um, I finally understand why God didn't listen to one of my prayers. Because there's something in me that just seems to like fight. <laughs> and religion has told me that's bad, right? Mm -hmm. And so trying to be right, I said, God, please take this away. And finally one day he said, I put that there on purpose, so don't ask me again. You'll never be able to do what I've called you to do if you don't have that in you. 
And so I just accepted that, but I never understood it until I saw this scripture. <laughs> it had to be in there because God wants me in the promised land. And he actually put something in me so I can enjoy the trip. <laughs> Because you're not going to tell me I can't go in. Nobody's going to tell me I can't go in, especially the devil. You done picked the wrong guy to fight with. God, prepare me in my mother's womb for this fight. Just because it took me 54 trips around the sun to figure it out, don't matter. I figured it out before I went to heaven. So here we go in Jesus' name. All right. Turn to Luke 22 real quick. Luke 22. I'm going to read it first from the King James, and then I'm going to read it from the Living. We're going to look at verse 24 through 26. And there was also strife among them, which of them should be counted, accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. <clears throat> I've never seen this before. And I even hesitate to bring it out. But I believe this is from the Lord and religion is going to hate it. You know, you can learn just as much from what people don't say as what they do say. Let me draw the picture. Here's the disciples saying, well, which one of us is the greatest? Which one of us is the greatest? So basically they're saying, you know, I want to be great. Notice what Jesus didn't say. Jesus did not say, who do you think you are wanting to be great? You ought to learn your place. You ought to blah, blah, blah. Instead, what did he do? He told them how to be the greatest. If you want to be the greatest, you be the servant. Let me put it in a modern day term. John Kennedy said the same thing. JFK, one of the greatest presidents we've ever known. Put it this way, ask not what your country can do for you but ask what you can do for your country. I don't think JFK would be elected today. <laughs> I don't think his party would keep him today. But that's the absolute truth. If you want to be great, you have to serve. Let's look at the same scripture in the living, the new, or the living Bible. Verse 24 of Luke 22. And they began to argue among themselves as to who would have the highest rank in the coming kingdom. Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men order their slaves around, and the slaves have no choice but to like it. But among you, the one who serves you best will be your leader. That actually ties into what we looked at in the beginning of the sermon last week where God said in Genesis 1, 26. Well, let's read it one more time. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image after our likeness and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea birds of the air and the tame of beasts and over all of the earth and over everything that creeps on the earth. So you, you've even got authority over creeps. <laughs> Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, 
and fill the earth and subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God and man. Basically, Jesus repeated here, if you want to be great, you've got to go back to the original purpose of man. That's to be, use all the vast resources of earth to be in the service of God and man. Here's what religion tells you. Just serve God, forget about man. And you shouldn't want resources. That's religion. Religion says stuff like, you need to learn your place. Who do you think you are? You think God could use you? Absolutely. I'm here to tell you, God placed something in you on purpose. While he's forming you in your mother's womb, expecting you to rise to greatness in your life, in his service and the service of man. That means two things. God has placed something in you, every person listening to me, Every person that ever hears this, every person that ever sees this, God, while you were being formed in your mother's womb, put something in you that's of value to not only him and heaven, but to earth. God wants you. If, if God didn't want you to rise to greatness and affect this planet, then Jesus would have rebuked the disciples when they're trying to figure out who's going to be the greatest. He wouldn't have said, this is how you do it. You serve. You serve. So if you don't remember anything else from today, I want you to know that God has placed something in you that is supposed to not only affect heaven, but affect earth. And it's up to you to rise to that greatness. Even if it takes you 54 trips around the sun to discover what it is and find out the path God wants you on, there is a path that he wants you on that is going to affect. Do not. You know what keeps you back? More than anything, it's what you allow to go on between these two years. It's what you allow to roll around in this thing up here. You, you let the devil control your thoughts. See, we have the, religion has the misconception that the devil always brings filthy thoughts or perverted thoughts or um, you know something along that nature no the devil will bring you thoughts that will cause you to give up on the greatness God planted in you to give up on the dream that God planted in you you think Joseph over the years he spent in the prison and as a slave might have had the opportunity to give up on the dream God placed in him. You think he ever wondered why in the world this ever happened? You know, I must have missed God. That dream must have been crazy. Do you think he ever had those thoughts? I guarantee you he had those thoughts. But he didn't allow those thoughts to rule and regulate him. The Bible says he kept an excellent spirit. And when the day came, he was ready. And he rose in one day from the jail to the second most powerful person on the planet at that day. I'm trying to stir some of you up. <laughs> you're, in case you're not catching it, there's something in you that God, <laughs> God could cause you to rise in one day. But here is the biggest thing that will keep you from greatness. It's not realizing God has you destined for greatness. <laughs> Thinking there's something wrong with that. Religion has taught you there's something wrong with that. You shouldn't think that way. You should just accept your lot in life. When God said subdue the earth and use all its vast resources to serve me and man. And religion tells you, you just need to accept where you are. You need to be content. Content does not mean satisfied. <laughs> I'm content with where I am, but I ain't satisfied. You understand the difference? <laughs> Problem is, religion has, has 
substituted content for satisfied, just be satisfied with whatever God gives you. Yeah, well, if you take the fullness of what God gives you, I agree with that. But God's given you the authority. You know, Jesus got in a lot of trouble one day for saying, I'm the Son of God. This is in John uh, chapter 10, if you want to go home and, and read it, where they were going to kill him. And he said, well, for, for what, which work? Which one of these miracles are you killing me for? And I said, not for the miracles. We're killing you because you made yourself equal with God. And what did Jesus do? He didn't say, well, oh, you're right. I shouldn't have said that. Well, no, he said, don't you read your own scripture? It says in, in, in the, your own word that you are God's little G. See, we have a problem with that right there. Boom, just that right there. Those are the words of Jesus himself. You are God's little G. That means you've got a whole lot more control over what happens to you in your life than you want to admit or realize or fess up to. Now you can tell your religious bones are getting rattled right now. But hey, it's the words of Jesus. I'm trying to shake you out of every bit of religion because religion will keep you back from what God has for you. Not just what God has for you, but there's something so incredible inside every one of you to affect this world that that same thinking that will keep you back from what God has for you will keep this world from receiving what God has for it through you. How many graves are there on this planet that what God had planned for the world never came because those people gave into religious thinking instead of finding out for themselves what God had for them, finding out for themselves what God said, just taking the word of some other human being as if it's the word of God. I hope I've challenged you enough to go search this out yourself. Because I'm not afraid of the Holy Ghost teaching you. <laughs> he will reveal to you. My job is just to kind of prod you to realize that there's a whole lot more than you've accepted at this point. That God, God has something to shape the planet that he's placed in you that will be not only for his glory, but it will raise you to, listen, God, when, when you give in to God, Abraham was the richest dude around. God said, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing to the whole earth. Isaac got so wealthy in famine. He sowed in a year of famine, received a hundredfold that year in famine when you're not supposed to be able to get anything. And he got so wealthy, the king of the area came to him and said, Hey, you've got to move. You're, you're making us look bad. You've got more than we you've got more than the whole kingdom. So you've got to get out of here, man. Put some more distance between us and you. You're making us look bad. Don't you want the president coming to you and say, you got to leave this country because you're making me look bad? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Say this with me. Say, God has more for me than I want to admit. But I choose right now, Holy Spirit, I give you permission to come and wash out of me, and out of me all, religious thinking, all religious thinking, all religious holdups, hold so, so I can walk in the fullness, in the fullness of what you've created me for, what you've, for, what you've planned for me to do, me to do here, on this earth. here on this earth. And I thank you, I thank you. that when that's done, when and it's my time to die, time to die I get to come to heaven. But I also thank you that I can have heaven on earth because of what Jesus did for me. In Jesus' name. One little kind of funny story. I've been listening to that guy that was telling you about. And uh, he was just a farm boy from 
Was it Idaho? Yeah, Idaho. All he knew how to do was milk cows. He said that didn't pay very well. So uh, he got a job. And by the time he was 25, he said, I was broke. He said, I wasn't destitute, but I was broke. And that's when someone showed him this possibility. But anyway, he, he became wealthy by the time he was 30. 25, he's broke. By the time he's 30, he's very wealthy because he applied some of these principles that if you listen to him, it's basically all the principles, the Bible principles. He, in fact, he quotes the Bible more than anything else. And the principles in the Bible. Um, where was I going? <clears throat> oh, but um, so after he got famous, he got the attention of the Chevron Corporation. How many know who Chevron is? And they asked him to come and speak to their whole, uh, their big organization. And because they wanted to kind of get an insight on what the next 10 years was going to be like. And they thought, this guy's doing so well, he, he, he must have insight. So they asked him that, he said, yeah, you're right, I do know the right people. And so he said, they all kind of leaned up and listened. He said, the next 10 years is going to be kind of like the last 10 years. <laughs> and anyway, he said, you know, the sun's going to come up in the morning. <laughs> it's going to go down in the evening. <laughs> That's not going to change. After spring is going to come summer. After summer, he said, if you want to know how the world's going to work, it's going to be about the same as the last 6,000 years. It's going to be opportunity mixed with difficulty. He said, now sometimes difficulty is greater and opportunity is less, or opportunity is greater and difficulty is less, but it's going to be the same mix for the next 6,000 years. Isn't it funny, human nature is, let's get a secret to make this thing easy. When, if you just will accept certain things that aren't gonna change, seed time and harvest doesn't change. If you plant seed, you're gonna reap. If you don't plant seed, what's funny to me is, is watch people not plant seed and expect to reap. Or not so and expect to proceed. It don't work that way. God said it himself, as long as the earth remains. So as long as you're on earth, you know, here's one of the funny statements he made. People complain, well, it shouldn't be that way. He said, well, when you get your own planet, you can set it up any way you want to. Right now, you're a guest on this planet. <laughs> so there's certain things you just got to accept. And there's other things you don't have to accept. Now, I'll tell you this, even the things that you can't expect with God, if he speaks something to you, you can even override those things. You remember the day that Israel was in a battle and the sun started going down and Joshua prayed? And the sun didn't move for a 24 hour period. The sun stayed up. However, something stood still, and the sun stayed up for until Israel could win the battle. Now, I, you know, if you want to think about stuff like that and try to figure it out, you can't. Because I would think, well, why didn't God just do one of them things where they move real fast and and the battle was over in a whole minute. Why just give them an extra 24 hours to win it? You know, when you get to heaven, if you still care, you can ask him. You know, I don't think he cares. But he was obviously on Israel's side and overrode nature for their benefit. I'm telling you, there may be cases where you're facing something and for your, your benefit, God will override nature. He's telling you to speak that or pray that. Or, but most of us, our thinking is so corrupt by religion that we won't even dare believe God for the things that he will do on our behalf. I remember God spoke to me way back in the, I think it was the 80s. We were 
I was working full time as a painter and we had started doing a young adults group volunteering at the church that we were at and the Lord said, I want you to come to the church and pray every morning at 7.30. Uh, and you know, anybody that wants to come, just tell them you're gonna be there and they can come pray, because it usually mean Jesus. But I remember thinking, I remember the natural thinking, I don't know if I can really afford to do this because you know, I was self-employed, I needed to be getting on the job and different stuff like that. <laughs> but it was the most amazing thing that when I would go and do that, it's like I would get a whole day's worth of work done before noon. I still don't know how that happened. I can't explain it. I just know when I gave God the first part, when he said that's what he wanted, then what I had to do just seemed to, you know, there's all kinds of little things that can get in and slow you up. And it seemed like when I went and prayed first, none of those little things ever showed up. And God overrode some of that normal stuff in life. And it didn't seem all that important just to go and pray. But I, you know, I, don't, I have a feeling in, in eternity, I'll see what those prayers affected. In fact, I, in the natural, I thought I was wasting time because I would get in there and I had this certain CD I would listen to every morning that had a heavy anointing on it. And after about five minutes, I'd be gone. And I'm thinking, you just sleeping, you lazy thing. <laughs> and now I realize what was happening. I was being slain in the spirit. And every morning I would go in there and pray and the anointing would hit me. And the next thing I know, I'd come to 30 minutes later, 40 minutes later, whatever. I'd come to on the floor and think, well, you just, you just might as, the devil would say, you might as well stay home and sleep rather than do this. But now I know, because back then we weren't moving in things in spirit. We hadn't been exposed to it, didn't understand it. I can look back now and see what was happening. I was learning the presence of God and his presence would come in. Boom. I was gone. And who knows what kind of internal operation he was doing. That's why we sing this song, we allow the river of God to come to us to touch us. We allow the river of God to come in us to change us because you can experience the touch of God hit the floor and not change. That's just him coming to you and touching you. When he touches you, you are going to have a reaction. Just, just as surely as if I stuck live wires in these plugs out here and you grab both live wires on the end, you are going to have a reaction. When the presence of God comes and touches you, you're going to have a reaction. But then you have a choice to make. Are you gonna let that same presence come in you and do its work in you and change you from the inside out? And start listening to his voice more clearly. So if you don't remember anything else from today, I want you to remember God has put in you greatness. But it's up to you to allow him to bring it out. And there's a fight to get there. There's a fight to get into the promised land. You have to throw out the occupants there now that are occupying what's yours. And in, in those days, it was literal physical people. In these days, pretty much, it's demonic activity that has occupied what belongs to us. And we need to throw them out in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God has greatness for who? Me. Me. You. The Father, in the name of Jesus. We give you permission to rid us of religious attitudes, religious thinking. And Father, I pray that for each of us in this room and for each person watching this video, that your spirit would reveal to us in a short period of time 
purpose you have us here on this planet for. We receive the warrior mentality that it takes to go into the promised land, that which belongs to us in the name of Jesus. I break every lying spirit that's influenced on our hearts and minds. I break that off of your people in the name of Jesus. I break that off of anyone watching this video in Jesus' name. I say, be free from the lie of the enemy, from the torment of the enemy, and you walk in the destiny that God has for you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, go with us this week. Use us as an instrument of eternity, and we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name. Amen.